So Fanny Bocanta and Juan Logue, Nicolas Samuelan, and uh, Gwendoline Torpera will uh, present the, the ongoing study uh, focused on the site of uh, Enmalan archives. Thank you, Julien. Thank you for the invitation. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, everything is OK. Good. So we are going to present here the fruit of a collective work, which is currently taking its first steps and in which other researchers will uh, soon join us, hopefully. This photo is one of the very first taken at Enam Malaha when uh, uh, it started to be explored in November 1955. A few months before, the site has been partly destroyed by uh, the installation of the Nekorot water pumping factory. Jean Perrault was mandated by the Israel Antiquities Authority to car carry out a rescue excavation of the site in three seasons, and it will lead to the statement of Enan as a major prehistoric site to be protected. Later on, from 1959, Perrault will dig on behalf of the French National Center for Scientific Research. From the first season, Perrault identifies a major <coughs> occupation of the Natufian on more than two meters thick, thick, stratified in several levels and laid on paleolithic layers. This uh, first discovered structure you have here on the picture remains today the most enigmatic one. Perrault calls it the large tomb, but later he will reconsider it as two shelters built on top of each other. This one uh, had, has a massive wall made of plaster a feature sti still unique today for the Natufian, all sites together, unique and often ignored by young researchers because it was published very long ago. And the nearby burials, which have become icons of the site over the years. You are here a family picture of the team uh, that uh, act in the rescue of uh, the skeletons in 1956. And here, Peru himself alone, who strikes a pose with pride next to this famous skeleton uh, surrounded by stone. And here you can see how two of the skeletons were prepared to be lifted in blocks and be displayed in the Upper Galilee Museum of Prehistory at Mayan Barro where they still stand today, thanks to the faithful and passionate curating of Amnon Asaf over almost 70 years. Beyond these extraordinary discoveries, which were to multiply over the years, and then become, above all, matter for reflection at the beginning of the sedentary life. Indeed, since the first season at Malara, Peru is suspecting a long-term occupation. He even briefly mentioned the discovery of possible dwellings in a paper published in 1957. But this is only from 1959, after the discovery of the well-preserved rounded structures 26 and 29 that you have here on picture, that Peru will strongly claim pre-Neolithic permanent settling. Kenyon had just finished excavating Jericho, and Peru naturally refers to this type. The discoveries at Enan may throw some light on what prepares the first settlement of Jericho. The circular houses found at Enan in a lower Natufian context are the prototypes of the circulinear Jericho houses. Enan, in an environment which included the potentially domesticable plants and animals in their natural habitat and in exceptionally favorable conditions, was already a permanent settlement. This indeed is a very important statement at that time, when everyone considered the Natufians as nomads with cemeteries. The site is still today considered as a permanent settlement, at least for the early and final occupation. The late Natufian shows less continuity, maybe a return to a form of nomadism. Forty meters squares were excavated under the direction of Jean Perrault, who explored the sector that is here in uh, red. He was joined by Monique Le Chevalier and Francois Valla in the, nine, in the 70s, sorry, who uh, drastically modified the excavation method. From 96 to 2005, Francois and Hamouli Ralaili, sorry, from the Israel Antiquities Authority, 
took over the excavation of the site by opening a new sector in which they excavated the upper layer, this is to say the final Matushin. We also say from erosion four graves that were on the surface of shelter 26. They are dated from the early Matushin. François and Ramoudi's excavation were published abundantly and the monography is ongoing under the direction of José Miguel Pereiro. Our current project concerns the western part of the site. This has been published, but the publications are brief. Some are dated and other uh, are um, monographies which are um, restricted to one kind of material. And this contrasts uh, sharply with the quality and the quantity of the archives that Perrault left behind him. The main volume of archives of the site is hosted at Nanterre. Another part is stored at the CRFZ and is intended to be transferred at Nanterre quite soon to be processed by archivists. The Israel Antiquities Authority is hosting copies as well as most probably some original documents at least from the three uh, first years of the dig, but that must be confirmed. The field archives of the site were produced under the scientific responsibility of Jean Perrault and later uh, François Valla. And they include different types of documents uh, that Julie already has uh, presented. The fond Perrault was processed by Erwan Le Guet under the supervision of uh, Aurélie Montagne and Elisabeth Bellon. The finding head, which is a list of the documents or uh, folders that are available uh, in Nanterre, is online. But the documents themselves still need to be digitalized in order to be able to uh, make uh, the archives uh, available uh, for everyone. So we are now in step two. Uh, for that, we need to raise money. We try uh, hard uh, in an application in 2018 that uh, was uh, also supported uh, by uh, many different partners that failed. So uh, we need to try again. In the future, those archives could be enriched by other funds of different researchers in order to obtain a more complete virtual collection of Malara's field archives and uh, scientific analysis. Erwan also produced the finding aid on the archives of Garod, which are um, housed by the National Museum of uh, Archaeology, uh, which is in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, not far from Nanterre. And uh, Erwan built a guide of sources gathering together uh, those three Natufian sites, Elwa, Chukba, and Malaha, on the same searchable tool, uh, which also has been enriched by other documentary sources a bibliography collection created on Zotero. And that uh, will be soon uh, uh, accessible on open access. This is not the case yet. This virtual collection could be enriched in the future by other sites as um, Munrata, Beisamun, uh, Abu Ghosh, all uh, the archives that uh, we are hosting uh, in France. So what scientific issue can be raised from these archives? We already have started to work on the different on different topics, but many more are likely to emerge over time. And once the scientific team will be expanded, and you are most welcome to uh, join us. Nicolas will present you. Nicolas Samuelian, sorry, will present you now his uh, own interest on those archives. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, last excavation have shown that the village is occupied permanently during the final Natufian. I have studied the different dwelling structures for my PhD recently published. As you can see, those final Natufian structures are embedded within a dense stony layer and are really not easy to identify. According to the publication of the excavated by Perrault, they did not find any final Natufian structure at the exception of two graves in blue on the map. Is it a question of erosion of the final layer in this sector or a question of non-identification? Non in fact, the Perrault mentioned in, 19, in 1957, as Fanny said earlier, are mostly 
probably Zeus one on the left found immediately below the most likely being final Natufian structures. This sector, called upper or south sector by Peru, is located at the south of the main sector and was never published. But the main sector here on the right seems as well to have provided structures embedded in the stony layer, which is also present on top of the stratigraphy in this part of the site. Preliminary reality has been done based on previous published data, but my wish is, go, is to go through all notes on original, original drawings to pursue this work that will be done with, with the support of INRAP and the CNRS. Peru himself has doubt on some stratigraphic attribution and his thought can be followed over time in reading attentively the, this archive. In addition, in the frame of the collective project, we plan to build a GIS database on the site. The archives are providing us with very precise and numerous spatial and elevation data for its structure. And there is hope that it will be very helpful in better, in better understanding the profusion and the succession of the building over time. It is a great opportunity to follow the planning of the site over the long durée and the symbolic and functional permanence of the places, as for instance, here the pavement over the plastered wall you have seen before is likely an addition from the final Natufia. Thank you. Our second current, current scientific issue are the numerous pits found on the site and especially during the late Natufia. Half of them have lime plaster or clay coating on the walls. Perrault suggests some of them are storage pits, but some are also used as collective grave structure. Others could be refusal pits. In order to go further in their understanding, we started to look in details their types, their filling, their interrelation, and relation to other structures. As you know, the question of storage pits is really crucial to understand hunter-gatherers, social structure, and way of life. It is also important to understand why those pits become so frequent at the time of a return to less permanent life at Malara. Our third current focus is to highlight the exact relation between graves and houses, and more generally between the dead and the living. I have started to look at the archives related to shelter 26 because this is where we rescue four skeletons from erosion, as I said before. The archives show that few bones were already visible in 1959. Fragments of skulls were collected, and this is really lucky because they give the stratigraphical link between old and recent dig and the possibility to recontextualize those skeletons in the general history of the dwelling structure. Secondly, we project a new dig focused on this shelter in order to answer two specific questions. Is there more grave associated to this shelter? And in this case, this is most probably urgent to rescue them. Secondly, we need to gather information left on the chronology of the grave and the building, because there is a possibility that the graves precede the dwelling. And of course, this is a crucial information in our understanding of settling process. While working on the archives of uh, um, shelter 26, I discovered new data on the two skeletons that were found by Perrault on top of the stratigraphy of this shelter. Part of their bones are deeply embedded in the world. Perrault observed those facts. He even highlighted in his notebook, but finally did not, did not mention it in the final publication of 1988. It echoes other examples we have found in within uh, the final Natufian layers. The burials indeed seems to participate actively in the functional planning of the village and the dead uh, would have as well a symbolic role of humanizing in the literal sense, the living space through targeted contribution. I believe the study of the archives and the GIS tool will provide us with great data on that specific questions as well. In conclusion, Perot's archives open up a new research dynamic on the site. Our collective project opts to provide the keys to a better spatial and temporal understanding of the occupation of the site. 
And what this might say about the reinvention of space and territory by these very first sedentary people. Secondly, we will also develop the questions of the flow towards the interior and the exterior of the village to question the modality of construction of the functional, functional but also the symbolic space uh, in context of sedentarization. The third aspect is dedicated to the transmission of this archaeological heritage to the scientific community by the digitalization, the translation into English of the online research aid, uh, <clears throat> the construction also of an interactive cartographic interface, and to the valorization of the site to a wider audience, for instance, uh, by a little um, movie. And the fourth working package will be presented to you by Gwendolyn. And uh, you'll see that, uh, uh, Julien, it will answer some of your pre previous suggestions you had made. Thank you for your attention, Gwendolyn. It's, uh, uh, I'm uh, talking again to present more specifically what the constitution of oral archives implies in so uh, social anthropology concerning the site of Malara, both with regard to the data that I have produced, uh, the theoretical questions that have emerged from it, and the perspectives that are taking shape within the framework of the preparation of an INR dossier in which it will be a question of the fabrication of the archaeological narrative in one of the components. Um, a project of memorial and filmic uh, recollection that the case to the archaeological site of Malara was born in September 2019, following a larger project of oral archive production um, uh, for the prehistoric ethnology team that began with R.C. Circuit, as I presented in the introduction. Um, within the framework of Malara, based on knowledge of the influence of the work and methods of the French School of Prehistory on the international scene, and this until today. A certain number of epistemological questions were linked to the research carried out by André Leroy Gouran, whose ambition was to train scientists in field archaeology and to bring them out of their isolation by creating various bridges. Uh, including that of the geographical areas in which each had become a specialist. André de Ragouin thus trained a whole generation of archaeologists in scientific methods from the excavation to the restitution of the results. The prehistoric ethnology team currently carries this legacy through the large archaeological sites that some of its members have studied and that of Malara is among the most important. The project uh, for uh, the Pearson parent in the South Levant. The project started with the idea of conducting uh, oral, semi directive interviews of key actors having a direct and multi generational link with the excavations of the Malara site. For this purpose, I wanted to experiment with the um, with the implementation of a group interview built on the basis of individual interviews. And among the individual interviews, the first choice was François Valla, an emblematic figure after Jean Perrault for this site. The prehistorian work at Mala between um, 1972 and 1976 through Jean Perrault, then from 1996 and 2005. Each person was then chosen according to their proximity to the prehistorian and above all, um, the main criterion the fact of being from the generation train uh, in the Near East uh, by François Vallin, that is the specialist who accompanied accompan him from the beginning of the second phase of his involvement in the Mala field. In order to convert the questions, researchers close to the French collaborators were chosen for this launching stage of the project. So we have Nicolas Samulian, who arrived in 1996, uh, and Fanny Bocantin and Boris Valentine in 1997. Um, the methodological device consisted first of its establishing a framework of questions adapted to each person and providing a thematic and chronological framework, thus following the carry and the evolution of research stems and ways of doing things uh, through it. The questions that were more outside the framework of archaeology were finally asked uh, at the beginning 
and dealt with that uh, preceded the training uh, what have awakened the taste for history, which has often linked to family history. Um, slide after uh, Fanny, please, because I cut our presentation. Thank you. To quickly illustrate the reflections towards which this type of corpus can lead anthropology, I have chosen to read a short extract uh, from the interview conducted with Francois Vallat. Um, he, say, he says, I, I arrived at Malaga in 1972 with a thesis subject that was proposed by Perrault on the Flint industry. At the time, the study of the Flint industries was essentially the Burroughs method, which was, uh, which was based on a statistical approach. Uh, Jean Perrault had never sifted did anything but the flint industries of Malaga or microlithic industries. To study them according to the protocols of the time, they had to be recovered in their entirety first. So I arrived, oh, I don't know if it's correct, but with my big hooves, uh, saying that we had to sift. It was not the best way to be seen. On the one hand, I was indeed a true disciple of André Le Gourand because I was really impregnated with his ideas, which was already worrying. And on the other hand, I had requirements that were disturbing because of the needs of my thesis and of the bodification, as we said at the time. In any case, the later put me at odds with what was being done in Malaga. So this extract refers uh, to the way in which an individual account makes it possible to restore fundamental methodological aspects. For those who want to understand the influence of André Laura Gouron at the time, as well as that of boards. And it also makes it possible to reveal the sometimes irreversible turning points in the ways of considering the archeological ground in itself. These first interviews also confirm certain certain aspects of the legacy of John Perrault's works and methods on those of François Vallin, who find himself the bearer um, of a certain way of reading this very specific terrain of Malaga. Since Jean Perrault, we can see that the evolution of methodology reveals much more than an evolution of paradigm in prehistory in these regions linked to habitat with the influence of structuralism, the place of symbolism, etc. I find there an evolution of the perception of the time necessary for the excavation with a meticulousness pushed to its paroxysm towards which François Vallat tends almost as of his arrival in the years 70s when he claims the systematic sifting of the vestige with weather. He systematized the work of excavation is querying and reduced the passes to five centimeters maximum. This um, surgical slowness, which will only increase is finally proportional firstly to the density of the remains and secondly to the meticulousness of the time scale that can be restored. I'm thinking here of Fanny's work uh, the interpretation that she managed to provide a certain structures are linked to extremely thin temporal scales since individuals are identified. I'm thinking of this woman from structure uh, to uh, uh, 203 of which she speaks in her interview. She say, I, I cut uh, uh, the first uh, uh, the first part, the death of his person uh, and his burial, there implied a change in the status of the structure itself. And after she uh, adds, there was just a lag time between when they decided it was going to be a house and why they actually moved in. It is interesting to note that this latency time corresponds to the biological decomposition of the corpse. There are three times and the liminal periods corresponds to the moment when the corpse passes from the world of the living to that of the dead. It is the time of mourning. Uh, this type of interpretation, as well as many others, would not have been possible without the meticulousness of the excavation, a survey of the gravel and the privileged place of observation. Um, uh, without this way of working in the field that Fanny inherited in large part as a specialist. 
this methodology, which is specific to François Vallat and which Jean Perrault also had an influence on, even if it is neither claimed nor ostentatious, ostentatious, yes, uh, is adapted to the density of the material. I see it as a complex genealogy of temporal regimes. Methodology has a predominant place and it is necessary to consider certain institutional factors that emerge in the collective interview, notably concerning these injections to results, speeds and efficiency in relation to the financing and renewal of campaigns that depend on them. The temporal reasons of each of them are linked to empirical factors, methodological and institutional factors, political, and both of which are directly linked. The political uses of the past are not referring to the history of archaeology. It is a whole field of multidisciplinary analysis that opened up in Mala from the work of Jean Perrault. Uh, if I have five minutes more, it will great. Um, what uh, as uh, for the first um, uh, for, for to introduce uh, this um, construction, what have uh, what has seen oh, sorry what has been accomplished so far opens up new perspectives with the INR project directed by Fanny Bocantin, reinventing speciality in a context of uh, primo sedentarity and in particular the first axis. Uh, and detail evolution of the archaeological narrative and social structuration of human time and the intervals of prehistory and the present. The declination of the sub-axes correspond to different ways of apprehending time, whether it be the temporal structures of the life of an excavation site, the biographical scales of individuals, whether they are archaeologists themselves or those who trace it define, and finally, historical time evolving according to the point of view and the roles of those who produce archaeological knowledge and the associated narratives. The first point, temporal structures of daily life on the Malacha seat and evolution of methods. Production of scientific knowledge in its, this context will be approached from the angle of the methods in Jean Perrault, treatment of density of the gravel, the place of observation, as well as the rhythm of work that will guide the ways of apprehending this type of terrain. The influence of the planimetric apprehension of an excavated soil as it was done at Pinsvent will be analyzed and compared to the way the structures at Malara were excavated. It would also be interesting to understand the relationship with Kathleen Kenyon and what a possible much would say about the almost different methodology chosen by it. Rhythms and forms of organization of work. The question of rhythms raises the question of an asserted choice to work in the field in a certain way, in a team and in a multidisciplinary way. For example, as was initiated by Jean Perrault, but also keeping a certain slowness synonymous with rigor with François Vallat. These work choices are not without consequences on the results in the interpreted data. The influence of André Laura Gouron will be questioned in this part. Second point on a human scale, biographical accounts of archaeologists. Um, a corpus of oral archives will be constituted in the continuity of the interviews already carried out. Uh, by emphasizing interviews carried out with prehistorians working in Israel by, for example, Naama Goreninbar, Mina weinstein Evron, Anna Belfer Cohen, Hamoudi Khalayri, but also Daniel, Daniel Storder and Monique Le Chevalier. The objective is to um, encourage exchanges and collective reflections by uh, collaborating directly with Israeli archaeologists of all generations, including those of who have been influenced in some way by the French School of Prehistory founded by Laura Grand, but also by the colossal work done at Mala by François Vola uh, and Jean Perrault. To this end, the interviews will be conducted in the more uh, tongue of each participant and subtitled in English during post-production before broadcast. Times, time of the tools, on the one hand, it is 
from the point of view of certain works on material culture that the figure of the prehistoric craftsman could be apprehended, notably thanks to the contributions of technology combined with a very fine excavation, a very strong, uh, yes, I conclude, uh, a very strong focus on the individual ethos possible concerning the time of use of a tool and the time related to its invet investment. Uh, reference is made here to the uh, research of Laure Dubreuil, who produced a functional study of Natufian greening tools as part of a thesis. Um, yes, uh, it, for the third part, um, an history, a history of the prehistory of the South Levant will be specifically approached from the work of Abbe Breuil and Dorothy Garrard. This period is marked both by a departure from the biblical narrative and the parallel development of a policy of research in prehistory on the international scene. And uh, the work of Chloe uh, Owen, I, I can't say more. And uh, to conclude, uh, the last point, the evolution of a conception of sedentariness for the South Levant will be treated. This research will be conducted on the basis of biblical geographic uh, work and will be the subject of a master degree proposed in this sense. Sorry for um, the time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Fanny, Nicola, and, uh, and Gwendolyn. It's, uh, it's a very interesting and impressive. Uh, we will uh, then uh, present what we started to do on Munhata, but we are much in a <laughs> much more in a basic uh, approach of the archives at the moment. Um, so I will share my... Can you see it? Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, Julie, Elisabeth and myself uh, will today present uh, an ongoing uh, study focused on the on the archives of Jean Perrault's excavation at uh, Munrata. Uh, this ongoing study is part of the Serraston project uh, funded by the French National Agency for Research. And this project aims to better understand the beginning of the pottery production uh, in the Southern uh, Levant. So as you can see here, uh, the Southern Levant is a quite interesting region to better understand the widespread uh, adoption of poetry uh, during the Neolithic, because it is located uh, between two regions where the poetry uh, was invented. The first one is located, uh, I would say, in the southern part of Egypt, northern part of the Sudan. And in this region, poetry appears around uh, 9,200 KBC among uh, hunter-gatherer society. The second core area, uh, for pottery invention is located in the North and Levant, northwestern part of Mesopotamia. And in this region, the pottery appears much later, around 7,000 Calbici among farming societies. And so strangely, uh, or not, because pottery appears late in the South and Levant, this region has so far remained on the fringe of research uh, focused on the early pottery production in the Fertile Crescent. And so many questions uh, remain, remain regarding the beginning of the pottery production in this region. So the Seraphon project aims to shed new light on pace, causes, and processes underlying the emergence of pottery in the region. In other words, when, why, and how pottery uh, appears in the Southern Levant. In order to solve this historical question, we are conducting the Sarut uh, analysis of pottery assemblages coming from 10 uh, main, major early pottery Neolithic sites. Uh, as you can see here on the map, uh, some of them are located, uh, are located in the Jordan, Jordan Valley, namely uh, Sharagolan and Munhata. Uh, but we also included sites uh, which are uh, located in the Jezreel Valley, in the Ula Valley, and in the Bezar Sorek uh, Valley. So with few exceptions, these uh, early PN sites are attributed to one of the four main early Neolithic cultural entities, namely the Yarmoukian, the Biblos, the Lodian, or Jericho 9, and the Korean. 
Munhata is, of course, a very uh, important uh, site for this study. Uh, and I would say for two main reasons. The first one is that uh, Munhata is the second most largely excavated early Neolithic site in the South and Levant. So the site was, uh, of course, excavated by Jean Perrault uh, between uh, 62 and 67. And he opened a very large area because he excavated more or less more than 2,000 square meter. As you can see here, he opened two main uh, areas uh, called the Northern Field and the Southern Field. In both areas, uh, Jean Perrault found the early pottery Neolithic layers, which uh, are made up of few uh, circular uh, buildings with a stone basement wall and many pits which is of course a problem <laughs> when uh, you try uh, to solve uh, particularly chronological issues. Uh, the second reason why Munata is a very important site uh, for understanding the beginning of the pottery production in the Southern Levant is that this site yielded the third largest early pottery Neolithic uh, assemblages in the Southern Levant. Uh, Jean Perrault found uh, around 15,000 uh, shirts only for the early Neolithic. So, of course, it's a very, very important site uh, to, to understand the beginning, the development, and the collapse uh, of the first pottery making societies in the region. Now, the problems. Uh, as the studies progressed, uh, several stratigraphic sequences have, have been suggested for the site of Munhata. And the problem <laughs> started. At the end of the 60s, uh, Jean Perrault um, uh, published uh, sorry, uh, the following stratigraphic sequence. So mainly uh, from layer six to layer three, he identifies several uh, pre Neolithic B uh, layers, and then within the layer three, Jean Perrault identified potentially like a kind of sterile layer <clears throat> in some areas of uh, his excavation, the so-called uh, Palestinian hiatus. And then he identified several uh, pottery Neolithic layer, uh, particularly early pottery Neolithic layer, which is uh, which was divided in two main uh, stages, the so-called Charagoline phase, which is related to the Yarmoukian, and the Munhata phase, which is potentially related to the Lodian or Jericoline uh, uh, phase. And then he identified uh, three different stages for the Wadi Raba uh, uh, culture. So this is a general uh, stratigraphy uh, that Perrault published at the end of the 60s. At the end of the 80s, uh, Avi Goffer published uh, the Flint industry from the sites. And in his publication, he used the following stratigraphic sequence. <coughs> so in general, we have the same development that the one uh, published in Peros. But Avi Goffer introduced some intermediate archaeological layer between the one identified by Jean Perrault so, for example, he, he had some uh, layer called the uh, six, six to five, uh, five to four, four to three, and so on. He had, and this is a very important uh, aspect for our study, he had an intermediate layer between the pre potrineolithic and the potrineolithic that he called three, two. And then he combined the two early pottery Neolithic layer that was distinguished by Perrault in one single layer, like the 2B, Chargolan phase and Munhata phase. And then again, intermediate layers between each Wadi Raba phases uh, identified by, by Jean Perrault. So uh, I would say a quite different stratigraphic sequence. Few years later, uh, Yossi Garfinkel published a poetry and he used another stratigraphic sequence. So, okay, layer six to four is still pre Neolithic B. So it seems that the earliest uh, layer of the sites are quite clear. But then layer three, 
uh, was published by Guy Garfinkel as a sterile layer. Uh, again, the two archaeological layers divided by Pero 2B2 and 2B1 was combined in a single layer by Garfinkel, and the Wadiraba phases as well one single layer. And of course, when I started to, to study the pottery remains from the site, uh, I had some, some, I was a bit confused because I didn't know which one, <laughs> which sequence that I should use. Uh, so in order to clarify the stratigraphic sequence at the site, we decided to analyze accurately the field documentation, namely the notebooks, the locus and catalog description, the photos, the drawings, and to combine all of the field documentation produced by Jean Perrault in order to try to clarify uh, the stratigraphic sequence of this major early pottery Neolithic site. And now Julie will present what she has done on the archives. Julie. C'est bon? Non? C'est bon. Slow. Okay. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, as I have already said in the previous presentation, the documentation concerning the excavation carried out by Jean Perrot at Munrata was very scattered and mixed, as some documents uh, were kept at uh, the uh, Centre Français de Recherche à Jérusalem others at uh, Jean Perrault's uh, residence in Paris, while others had been given by Jean Perrault to some of his uh, colleagues. The first stage uh, of this work was therefore to identify and collect all the documents resulting from these transfers in order to create a coherent series, which would be integrated into Jean Perrault archives fonds. Um, during this work, we realized that part of the primary feed documentation was missing. So Julien Vuguet therefore contacted Laura Kolka Horvitz, who kindly agreed to transfer the missing document to the MSH Monde uh, Archive Service. Next uh, slide, Julien. Uh, following this, uh, we survey the document in order to restore the original organization defined by Jean Perrault. Uh, an examination of the documents was undertaken in order to establish the original plan on the internal classification of the files. The documents were then sorted and described. We drew up a detailed classification and we create an online finding aid using the open source software Atom, access to memory. Uh, this software had been uh, developed with the support of the International Council on Archives and uh, it uses international archival standards. Next uh, slide. We describe the document with an item level description for the field documents, uh, notebooks, catalogs, uh, plans and section, photographic negative and size, and uh, with an open uh, file level description for the studies, reports, and preparation of publication. Next slide. Uh, at the same time, uh, each document of a folder has been given a reference number and uh, the documents were stored in permanent material containers, acid free uh, folders and boxes, which we allow their long time preservation. Next slide. After this uh, archival process, we were able to select the document for the digitization program. We decided to digitize all the original feed documentation, uh, notebooks, catalogs, plan section, photographic uh, documents, excluding the duplicates. Original plates of uh, object drawings were also uh, selected. The company chosen to carry out the digitization is uh, Tribun, a company specialized in heritage uh, digitiz digitization. 
next one. Before the digitization, we produce inventory files on, on naming tables for each image. For each document, negative sheet, plan, drawings, catalog, or notebook page, we have a JPEG file for use uh, by the researchers, a TIFF file uh, for digital arch archiving on the servers of uh, the MSH Monde CNRS Archives Department. And we also have a multi page uh, PDF files for online publication. Next one. So all the digitized archives have been published online. First, with uh, reserved access. And there's a document we eventually published in open access on, access, on the accessible to everyone at the end of the Serastone project. Uh, next. So uh, once the archival process and the digitization program were completed, we began the scientific exploitation of the digitized documents. The first step was to transcribe the unwritten feed notebooks into text files in order to facilitate the reading of the information. There's two notebooks correspond to the square notebooks in which Jean Perrault described the layers and architectural features discovered in each square, and the locus notebook in which is a description of each of the locus identified by Jean Perrault. There's two notebooks also contains uh, sketches and drawings. And next one. The second step was the recording of all the information uh, as location, description, stratigraphic position, graphic documentation, catalog numbers rated that, uh, that we could find into the two notebooks and also in the catalogs. We synthesized uh, this information in the spreadsheets for each of the 350 UOKI identified by Jean Perrault. All the information was also translated from French to English to help its use by all project members. Um, next one, the recording of the excavation unit called catalog number by Jean Perrault was also done in a, a spread sheet file. The information related to the 2,260 catalog numbers most uh, comes uh, mostly from the 14 excavation catalogs. Uh, next one. So after this uh, first recording, we began to reconstruct the stratigraphic re uh, relationship existing between each locus and each catalog number within each square. Since Jean Perrault only gave a locus number to the architectural features on the pits, it was very complicated to, determ to determine the stratigraphic links between the different locus. For example, most of the time, the stratigraphic layers or the flows, uh, even the plastered ones, uh, discovered during the excavation do not have a specific number but correspond to several catalog numbers. So we have uh, first uh, uh, chosen to, to concentrate on the south area, which was the first and the largest of the two excavated area. Uh, next one. So uh, for each square of the south area, we drew a stratigraphic diagram in which the locus are in red and the catalog numbers in green. To do that, we mostly use the information from the graphic journals, the notebooks, and the feed plans and section. Next one. At the end, we add 62 diagrams for the south area. And next. So finally, using the diagrams per squares on when it was possible, we drew a general diagram summarizing only the links between the different UK 
for the entire South area. Okay, your turn, Julia. No. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what Julie has done is, is a huge work. You cannot imagine uh, rebuilding, reconstructing a stratigraphic sequence for such large scale excavation. A large scale excavation is a very huge work. And, uh, and I would like to thank her for, the, for this uh, incredible uh, job that she has done. Uh, up to now. Um, she usually finished to build the stratigraphic sequence of the southern field of Jean Perrault's excavation last week. So I didn't, um, I should say, have time to, to start to introduce my data, but I hope in the next coming months I will be able uh, to do this. Anyway, we can start to have some, um, uh, okay, we can, Based on, on the stratigraphic sequence of the site, we can start to at least to raise a uh, new question about the history of the site and in general about the, the, the beginning of the first uh, pottery making society in the southern level. Uh, I will raise here just two questions. Does the layer three correspond to an habitat level or a gap? Because uh, as I said, uh, Jean Perrault identified a sterile layer between the PPN and the PN once, the so-called uh, Palestinian Yatus, but he always say it was not so clear because this uh, sterile layer only appears in some areas in the layer three. But this question, the presence or not uh, of a sterile layer between the PPN and the PN is, is quite crucial. Uh, because, of course, if there is one, it supports the hypothesis that exogenous potters population produce pottery in the, south, in the southern Levant, so probably coming from the north, so the, the, the demic diffusion. Uh, in his pottery study, Joseph Garfinkel considered the, the entire layer three as a sterile horizon, reflecting a major uh, uh, gap in the sentiment occupation. So based on his studies, we have the impression that the, the hiatus uh, lasts quite long. But in his film study, Avi Goffer does not consider it uh, as a sterile at all. Uh, so the first question that we have to answer is, is it uh, uh, an occupation layer or a gap or a sterile layer? So if we look the stratigraphic sequence, if I can go to the next slide, if we look uh, the stratigraphic sequence uh, rebuilt uh, for the southern field, and here you have only a part of the Harris matrix, of the Harris matrix, uh, we can see that uh, Jean Perrault identified uh, 32 features uh, within the layer three. Uh, of which numerous architectural remains, including walls, floors, and pits. And here you can see these really very interesting and fascinating rounded buildings, uh, which were the, discovered within the layer three, so just below the early pottery Neolithic layers. And so now we can be sure that the layer three is not, is not a sterile layer. It's quite, uh, it's quite clear. Uh, yesterday, I read again and again the, the Gopher's publication about the flint, and he wrote that the flint from the layer three shows some uh, typo technological differences with the ones from the layer <laughs> six and four, which are clearly typical uh, pre pottery Neolithic B uh, layers. So I just raise the question is it dated from the PPNC? <laughs> Uh, of course, I will not solve the, this question um, uh, today, but I think it would be very interesting to date uh, accurately uh, the layer three in order to have a better opinion about our, how long time uh, the Palestinian Yatus identified by Jean Perrault uh, lasts, because it's a, it's a very important issue. 
uh, our long time, the discontinuity observed by Jean Perrault uh, last uh, at, at uh, Munhata. The second question is, does the lawyer 2B correspond to one or two different stages? Because as I said, Jean Perrault distinguished, uh, you know, within the early Potrineolithic, a Shargolan and Munrata phases. And of course, this supports the hypothesis that the Yamukian culture is earlier than the Lodian one. Uh, but based on the Pottery and Flint study, Josef Garfinkel and David Gofer did not confirm such chronological subdivision. And so it supports partly uh, the hypothesis that the Yamukian and Lodian culture are uh, contemporaneous. And of course, this, this chronological aspect is very important because Monrata is one of the two sites where we could potentially identify a stratigraphic differences between the Yamukian and the Jerichonine. Uh, so we should definitely know if there is uh, two different archeological layer or just, or just one. So yesterday I just, Look where we have within the, the, the 2B layer. I looked uh, the different overlaps and overlies, overlies of, of the different structure. And I could only, for the South Sea field, I could only uh, identify uh, five overlaps. So it's not, uh, it's not a lot, but then I introduced my, the pottery data that I collected a few years ago. And According to the preliminary results, it's very preliminary, but what we can say is that the, the painted and inside pottery are associated within the same uh, locus and we cannot uh, distinguish an, uh, up to now an earlier layer with uh, inside pottery and a later layer with painted pottery. Uh, but of course the southern field is not the is not the best area to solve this question because it was quite eroded. So I think when we will have the, the stratigraphic sequence for the northern field, and maybe we will have more chance uh, to, to distinguish or not uh, the two different uh, layers uh, identified by, uh, by uh, Jean Perrault. So what we have done, we, to conclude, we, we have gathered, sorted, and recorded uh, Jean Perrault's archives related to his large scale excavation at Munhata. We scanned all of the field documentation uh, that includes uh, thousands of catalogs, hundreds of drawings, and thousands of photos. Uh, Julie recorded the, the data from Jean Perrault's notebooks, locus, catalogs, and translated in English. So it means that all of the members of the, of the project, and particularly the Israeli colleagues, can now have uh, easily access to this field documentation. And we uh, started to reconstruct the stratigraphic sequence of the southern field. Now we will have to, to do the northern field and then to integrate uh, the typo technological data that we collected on pottery production and on lithic tools. And this work will be done with, uh, in collaboration with Avi Goffer, who studied the, the, the remains uh, for his PhD during the 80s. And we will as well, uh, of course, try to date uh, the layer three and two uh, by taking samples from very well-defined context. And this uh, research will be done in collaboration with uh, Philippe Lanos, Lucille Beck, Christine O'Berlin and Mathieu Lebon. And so we will try at the end of this, uh, of this research to have a stratigraphic sequence, uh, okay, a high resolution chronostratigraphic sequence for the sites that will then allow us to raise a uh, specific question regarding the beginning of the pottery production in the South and Levon. And uh, within the framework of the Saraston project, we will uh, particularly uh, perform the functional analysis of pottery, combining typometry and residue analysis. We will as well uh, uh, carry out uh, a technological analysis of the, of the ceramic vessels uh, in order to uh, better understand why and how uh, 
uh, um, the, the people from the southern Levant start to, uh, to produce and use uh, uh, ceramic vessels. And then it's just an idea. Um, of course, at the end of the Serastone project, we will give a, a digital copy of the field documentation at the Israeli Antiquities Authority, where the collection at Munhata, the pottery, the flint, the grindstone, the shell ornaments, the clay figurines, and so on are stored. Because at the moment, it's very difficult for them to sort the collection because they have the collection, but they don't, they don't have the, the field documentation. So they cannot relate the collection to a specific archeological layer. But uh, at the end of the project, so we will, uh, we will give a copy uh, to the Israeli Antiquities Authority. And I hope uh, this huge work uh, undertaken on uh, Jean Perrault's archives will be the starting point of a new French-Israeli research project, which aims to reconstruct the long history of the village of Munrata, because Munrata has a, quite a unique stratigraphic sequence for the Jordan Valley. You have the pre pottery Neolithic B, uh, the, okay, the late PPNB, final PPNB, PPNC, whatever, uh, you call it, and then the Yamukian, and then potentially the Jericho line, and then the Wadiara. It's quite, it's quite great. And uh, but this site was never published, so it would be nice to develop some new research uh, topic about the, the architecture. The field documentation is is quite unbelievable, and it would be nice to have uh, I don't know a diachronic study of, about the architecture of the site of Munhata. The shell ornaments and bone tools was, were never published. And as well, we could re, um, reanalyze the remains from the sites uh, with a new approach. I thought about the flint, for example, and develop some useware analysis of the flint, which was uh, never done. So this site has a huge potential and it will take several years to, to explore it, uh, to explore all of, all of the, the field documentation that uh, Jean Perrault uh, produced uh, during this, uh, this uh, excavation. And I will, I will con conclude here. Thank you so much for your attention. And of course, this research is a collective one. So uh, we would like to thank uh, many colleagues, including uh, Liora and Orvitz and Natalia Gubenko. Thank you so much. So now we will be lucky if you want to. So now we will have a last presentation after the Natufian and the, and the Pottery Neolithic. We will have some presentation about the Calcolithic sites excavated by Jean Perrault. And this talk will be given by uh, Isaac uh, Gilad from the Denver And just, yes. Ah, wait. I'm going to just. Um, Thank you, Julian. Uh, I'm going to talk about the last period, or almost the last period. Uh, Jean Perrault dealt with, and it's the Chalcolithic period. This is probably his start of work in Israel because he came known to archaeology and to Israeli archaeology through his work in the Beersheba area in the early 1950s. I would like to start with, with a short background. Perot arrived in, Israel, in then Palestine in 45 with a booth for the Ecole Biblique. And then after a short while, they did manage there. So he left. And luckily for him, uh, René Neville became the consul. So he became his advisor uh, and also helped him. And as the time passed, he became the uh, the main figure behind or working with 
uh, with Neville. In 1951, in 1949, as was mentioned by Flo, he went to Umkata. Uh, and in addition, to Umkatafa, he went personally as far as he described to the site of Umkala and excavated it for a short while. Uh, in the same year, the chronology is not clear, but in 1949, he also had a trip to Vadi Zumeili with the Vidal. And this was practically the first time he read, he became familiar with Chalcolithic sites in the Northern Negev because Zumeli is not far from the Beshiva area. In 1951 and two, it was his academic year and the influence on him as far as I understood, understand is not the Roi Gouran, but is Francois Bourg. He spent quite a time with uh, the boards and he also excavated Peche de Laz, the, uh, the, Mustrian site of Peche de Laz. <clears throat> and while describing his work in his memories, he, he uh, describes the uh, principles of excavating. And I resume, I, so I, I assume that he learned or he become acquainted with these methods while being with bull. So the idea, for example, of a five by five square meters was adopted or learned there, although he mentioned that it can be one meter, five meters, etc., etc. Here I make a little jump before I go back to the uh, Chalcolithic. In 1955, he was asked by Yadin to participate in the Hatso digs. Uh, and from here, I took the name of my uh, paper, Le uh, Carré de Jean, because in uh, in uh, Hatsor, it became a kind of uh, attraction for people and for fellow archaeologists to see a different way of walking. And the use of five meter square was carried out only in his part of, of, uh, of, of the dig. <clears throat> it, is it, it is generally considered this his, that his work on, oh, sorry, at Hatsor uh, <clears throat> was influential in persuading Israeli archeologists to work with five by five square meters. Uh, <clears throat> however, as you can see, uh, he was not, very much impressed by the understanding of the Israeli archaeologists at the time. He thought that it's for them, the grid was only something exterior and not really understanding the, uh, the role of it. However, uh, some historians of uh, digging methods like Kempinski and Reich think that he introduced the system in Israel and uh, influence the locals. There is a different view. As you see, Perot squares made no impression on other Hatsor members because four years later, they went on digging their own system. And uh, so let's leave it open. What was his uh, contribution to the uh, development of the five square meters uh, idea. I want to stress two points. There was the Israeli system of excavation or the locus to stratum system, and there was the Kenyon Wheeler system, which Perot, in a way, uh, ad adopted. In a later uh, evaluation of the digging methods, Chapman. Uh, in, uh, 18, in 1986, called the system Jean adhered to after the and others and the scientific system. Instead of calling the Israeli system, he suggested to call it the scientific system and the system, the Israelis work, he suggests to call it the proto-scientific system. I mentioned it and I'll come back to it <clears throat> in a short while. 
What did Perot do in the Beersheba area or in the north in the northern Negev? As I mentioned, his first acquaintance was the field trip to Zumeil. And, and in Zumeil, as, as, as you can notice, he suffered for the first time probably the climate of the Negev, and it was hell for him. Maybe that explains some of his headwear uh, in the uh, slide. In 1952 <clears throat> uh, to 1954, he excavated the site of Abu Matar. From 54 to 60, the site of Bira Safadi. And then <clears throat> uh, later in the 60s, in the early 60s, he excavated another uh, group of sites. One is Gad Govrin. And in the Nahal Psori excavated practically sites A and B that McDonald excavated. So in a period of about 10 years, he covered most of the sites known at his time. And his idea was to create a complete picture of the, uh, of the Chalcolithic in the Sheba area. It is worth noting that <clears throat> in 58 and 59, he excavated the Azor Cemetery, where he found the famous ossuaries, <clears throat> which means, again, that in 10, <clears throat> sorry, my voice. <clears throat> it means, It means that in 10 years, he embraced all the uh, Chalcolithic phenomena, the big habitation sites and the, <coughs> and the, and, and the mortuary sites. During his dig in Beersheba, as Chloe showed, he was visited by many people. Uh, uh, he even rented a building or, or at least an apartment in Beersheba and uh, <clears throat> he was visited by uh, famous people. You can see some of them here, including prime minister at the time, and including David Tuviau, the uh, mayor of Beersheba. Uh, in the long run, this made some impression, I think due to the lobbying of Eliezer Oren. Uh, what's the problem? Due to the, <coughs> due to, uh, the lobbying of Eliezer Oren, he became a honorary citizen of Beersheba in 1987. Uh, and he was the fine archaeologist, discoverer of the Chalcolithic culture. Uh, just to give you the, uh, the impression of the company, the last one, 2020, Ruben Rivlin, <laughs> president of Israel. 2011, Shimon Peres, President of Israel. 1990, it's Chak Shamir, ex Prime Minister, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and Perot is one of these people. Some of, <coughs> of the things I've said, and I'm, uh, I'll go on saying, come from uh, these three books. The pottery by, uh, from Bira Safadi by Comanche Pellera, uh, and the PhD thesis of uh, Frederic Gouillou, which is practically a preliminary but a detailed publication of Abu Matan, sorry, of Bira Safadi. Already in 1952, when he excavated Zumeili in the on the, of the Negev, uh, he excavated with he excavated with uh, squares, as you can see, and he made he drew cross sections, which, by the way, Israeli archaeologists at the time never bothered with. However, <clears throat> his main achievement in terms of Digging methods. Uh, 
was can sorry was uh, Mira Safadi, and you can see the implementation of his system. The entire area covered in the grid is about a sorry ten thousand square meters, and excavated were about eight thousand meters of the whole. So it means that in terms of place in <clears throat> place in the archive, it is enormous probably. Later, in the in 1960, as I mentioned, he excavated Gat Govrin, and you can see here again the implementation of the system, of the square system. But what is of interest here is that after the uh, the site was after the squares were excavated, he simply eliminated the bolts and. Was and the, and the site was totally uh, open. In 1981, I had the chance to collaborate with uh, Perot in excavating the site of Gra, which means he gave us, for example, all the graphic uh, the uh, graphic diaries. As you can see below, we used the ones that. He brought, and I think one of you showed a, a sample of this graphic uh, uh, of this graphic uh, page. Uh, he was very meticulous in terms of uh, demanding, for example, all lossy numbers should be written in blue. <laughs> all baskets should be written in green and all it should be written in red. And this was a kind of, he uh, personally supervised it and he even <laughs> supplied the pens to, <laughs> to, uh, to implement it. Uh, the first season was, ex was uh, carried out with a French archeologist, a beginner then like me, Michel Villeneuve, uh, who was in charge then of preparing this uh, these uh, graphic uh, uh, diaries. Another thing he uh, was careful about was uh, he brought to Beersheba, you see these little square, uh, wooden squares. Okay, I hope you see it here. Uh, I saw he also used it in Munchata, right? Uh, to orient the people that someone in the square will look immediately adjacent to him and see the name of the square in case he forgot it. So the entire area was covered with this kind of, I doubt if you can see it. Okay. Uh, here is a, a is something from uh, Gad Govrin. <coughs> you can see the section. One of the uh, his contributions to the Halkolitic archaeology is careful uh, recording of sections in the field, not later in the lab. That was at least then the uh, the, uh, the way Israeli archaeologists did it: reconstruction or drawing on uh, photographs. And you can see to the upper left, sorry, to the upper right, a, a stake with a red hat. It was again one of his uh, peculiar uh, ways to let people know that uh, something very organized is going around. Be careful not to approach this chapeau rouge because you will ruin the grid because the string was a, uh, tied around it. This is a picture from Gra 1981 when he was kind of a partner and he was careful to take photographs from above. And uh, this is one of the photographs that we couldn't take at the time because we didn't have this big tower that he was careful to carry in and with him uh, the day we finished the excavation, he came with the tower 
put it and to photographs. Now about recording. Uh, from our point of view of working with artifacts, one of the most important point is the idea of numero de catalog. In Israel, we currently call it basket. And here you can see a, an example of a basket from from Locus, from Locus 693. Uh, and you can see a list of pottery kept and rejected, silex kept and rejected, uh, Pierre, etc., etc. Now, this is part of the archive. What can one do with the archive? Well, already in 1990, Comanche Pelaran used this archive and prepared a full uh, description of every lossy in the site. And as you can see, you can see, just a minute. You can see the catalog number, you can see the basket number, and you can see one is copied into the volume, into the report on the pottery, one by one. You see, here you have 16, 16 14, 350, 13, 14, 350, 99, 99, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you will notice that there are also inconsistencies. For example, in 21, there are 210, according to the uh, publication of, uh, of Catherine, and in the field report, there are 110. So maybe in the far future, after the archives are set and people prepare the volumes, there will come a third generation to solve the inconsistencies between the archive and the publication. Okay, and all this come on this lossy, you can see uh, lossy 393, uh, yes, 393. Uh, its location. I mentioned this lossy because it is adjacent to another lossy, 681. Mm -hmm. 681 in the center of the dig is important for people working with flint artifacts because here is a list of baskets, sorry, of catalog numbers prepared by uh, Guyu. And you can see at the bottom, bottom loss, losses 689. Now in 689, you will see 370 odd pieces of flint. How much was kept? Almost the entire quantity. If you look at other entries, you will see that maybe 10% are kept or less or a little bit more. The fact that he kept the, almost the entire assemblage means that he realized in the field that there is something. And the something is what we now uh, think is a sickle blade workshop because you can see the entire, uh, not the entire, but you can see an artifact that signify working with blades and breaking them, the use of microbial technique or, uh, or, uh, or lamel, lamel, forgot the name. Uh, I think in this context of the archive, we should never forget Daniela Direl because a lot of the archive is practically what he did because he was the documenter, he was the field surveyor, he was the artifact draftsman, pottery, clean, he did everything. So in the long run, I think that his work is a kind of a, a emblem of the Perot archives, the work of uh, Daniela Dire. He unfortunately died six years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Now a short appraisal. In 
the 1980s, as you realize, <laughs> I, was in, I was in contact with him and we talked a lot because he came to Beersheba to the big and then after the big we met. And once he asked me, it's not that I asked him, he asked me, what is an archeologist? I say, I don't define. So he said, it's an international playboy of science. <laughs> This has a meaning beyond maybe the jokey element of it, because Jean Perrault was, as many of you know, he was a character that, uh, that is larger than life. He was a larger than life archaeologist. He was, as I mentioned yesterday, a big boss. He was busy administ uh, administrating and controlling. And I think that this is one of the way it is reflected is on his close control to what is going to be. All these little chapeaux, either yellow or red, and all the details, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> so Levo, the level of Perot's recording is, I think, exemplary. I'm not saying that every system or every uh, element in his dig was the best available. For example, he in the Beersheba site never seen. So, but in terms of recording and putting uh, attention into details, he was exemplary. But the use he made of the record is a problem because he 40 meters, right, of uh, crates were created by him. And maybe the two significant results are the book on Les Hommes de Malacha, by the way, with Daniel Adire as a co-author, and the book on Tom Bausuel with Daniel Adire as co-author. Beyond it, all the famous IP excavated were never really published. So you have here a kind of contradiction. A guy that is bigger than life, likes the details, and the details he left behind, uh, as many of you show today, are uh, most, uh, uh, how, how do you call it? You can produce that, right? I like the, the combination to produce data. You can produce data from the, from the records. But when it comes to doing the archaeological work behind the dig, it's, it's very problematic. And this comes to a larger question. What is the contribution of the archival details to interpretation? And my conclusion is that if I go back to the terms I used at the second slide, Perot was a scientific excavator, no doubt about it, using the terms of Chapman, right? However, he was a proto-scientific interpreter because the a level of his recording was not reached by his interpretations because it seems that his interpretations are not going with time. For example, in the 1980s, he came back to Abu Matar and Bira Safadi, he published a long article in Palorian concerning the, uh, the dig at the site. His conclusion was that the period, period of Beersheba was between, let's say 550 to 350. Okay, this was totally out of range and totally unacceptable at the time but he practically ignored it. That's 84. <laughs> in 87, uh, Comanche Belleran Catherine published the first volume on the poetry of Abu Matar. And there he wrote an introduction and gave a kind of a summary of the periodization. And as you see, the C14 dates are listed below as a kind of note. There were three C14 dates, old C14 dates with a standard deviation of 350, right? Which made them in a way useless. However, here he presents without discussing new dates from Lyon, which are perfectly falling about, let's say, the 4,000. 
He just drinks them, never mentions them. <laughs> and in 1990, in the, in the Bira Safadi ceramic volume, uh, you, can, you can see it's a footnote in his, in his introduction, and he mentions the C14 date of the 19, early 1960s, I think. Mm -hmm. right, 1961, and forgot that three years ago, he reported of, he reported three C14 dates that are totally new, and they were irrelevant here. This is one example. Another example is his opinions on, uh, for example, the copper industry. One uh, uh, evening, I think Michel Delneff was there, he uh, the, uh, the issue of the Nachal Mishma Hob uh, was brought up and he said, leave it, I, th there are thousands of these in the markets of Tehran. Or later in the conference, he said, uh, uh, the Flint artifacts of the Yesheva people, they were like a Mercedes in front of a Tent of a Bedouin sheikh, meaning disconnecting the artifacts, the copper industry from the Chalcolithic people as if it was a kind of uh, input. Uh, I think that working with archives is not enough. Guyot in uh, 1940, in his PhD, gives quite a detailed description of every or many units in Abu Matar. And he never mentions C14 dates, which means to work with an archive is not necessarily, right, integrating recent data. So my main question remains, do archives replace <laughs> excavators? Because the archives are marvelous. But the only guy that was in the field and could see what's going on is not there. <laughs> I would like to thank Julian. Photographs by Chaboudi, Alayla Peter Fabian, and Mizrou Bazan. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. I think it was a great uh, presentation and raised many, many questions, especially the last one. Yeah. <laughs> Do our guys replace our excavator? Ah, okay. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, I don't have so maybe Francois, if you want to to introduce the discussion, and I can read what Jan said. Okay. Yes, great, of course. <laughs> yes, thank you, Julien. In fact, yeah, in fact, uh, unfortunately, Jan uh, was obliged to to leave us, so he he, he, he wrote a. Uh, an, an archives, something which is now an archives that, uh, we, that we will share all together. And uh, this archives uh, is in, in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for this very, very nourishing, uh, nu nourishing communication. But when I say nourishing, I can imagine also that maybe at one moment, uh, your stomach will ask to, to eat something. So, and it's uh, half past one in, in Israel, if, I, if, if I'm correct. So how long, Julien, do you want that we, we, we stay on stage? I don't know, 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Is that right or? 10 minutes? Well, okay. no, if we can no, but... start and then we'll Let's start and we'll see, and that's on point. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> um, I would say 10, 10 or 15 minutes and maybe think what we... So very shortly, just one, uh, one general comment uh, about the, the great, great qual quality of, uh, of what we have heard uh, this morning. It was really great. And to see all the different approaches that uh, you are all building around the Peru archives and, and more than Peru archives. But at one moment, Julien, you say it could be interesting to compare uh, Laura Gouran and Peru. Uh, and when you say that, I say, yeah, it's a little strange because it, it's two very different characters, very, very different scientists. They have, they, have tried it, but they have done very different things. But I, in fact, I think you're right. But in, 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 my, in, in, in my mind, in a certain way, 
what, what I want to say is the fact that Peru, maybe that no one is really prophet in his own country, uh, Peru has played a very important role for sure. And, and everything that we have heard uh, this morning show that. But in fact, if today uh, there is an heritage of, uh, of Peru, this is through Francois Vallard and through uh, uh, a part of a, of, a, of a team which is belonging to Le Roi Grand team. In fact, without, uh, Le, uh, without all the approach built on a theoretical point of view, on a methodological point of view, by Laura Gouran. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of part of, uh, of you are here because we are, we are, we are belonging to the, the team of uh, uh, Mertin that uh, you, you have heard a lot about Mertin. Uh, one of the main uh, totem of the Mertin is Le Roi Gouran. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and what, what I want to say is the fact that I don't know if there is really a, a theoretical and methodological heritage of, of, of Peru in France. There is a lot of data, a lot, a lot, a lot, but but truly we, we are we are all in in uh, belonging to the Le Roi Gouran heritage in, in some way. And what uh, Isaac has said uh, just in the last uh, communication, uh, I wanted to ask him and, and ask all uh, all our uh, Israeli colleagues and friends: Do you believe that there is really a, a, a theoretical and methodological heritage from Peru or not? are uh, only uh, a lot of beautiful data. And if, uh, who, uh, this, this is my general question to everybody. If I may, <laughs> uh, I think that in a way I answered in my lecture uh, your question. He was a, a magnificent recorder, mm -hmm. but much beyond so practically there is no theory and practically there is no integration so without theory and without integration of the data he produced uh, i do not think that there is a school in israel that follows Peru. yeah And you, Julien, what do you think about that? Or Fanny, or Francois, for sure? I fully agree uh, about you. Of course, Peru doesn't have any impact in, in, in France and the French-Israeli uh, excavation that, uh, that we are carrying uh, on uh, currently in, in, in Israel or, or before, of course, uh, is related to Le Roi Gouran School. It's, it's quite clear. In Israel, I don't know, from an outside point of view, if you look today in, in uh, Ramu, do you want to say something also? Huh? I, 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 uh, <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Con continue, Julien, but it's just to say that Ramudi uh, okay. has something to say. Okay, maybe it's a, it's a simple vision, but if you look the square five by five, it's, oh, what, yeah. it's, it's what exactly what they use in the Israeli Antiquities Authority. Uh, but it's controversial because so, some say that it's not because of him because the, the five by five penetrated maybe 20 years later and it was more because of Kenyon Wheeler. By mm. the way, Perot in his, in, in his memoirs, right, mentioned in this specific section that later in the 1960s or in the in 1960, when he was in the state, he became familiar with Wheeler's book. And then he said to himself, hey, it's the same like I did. But I doubt if the five by five square meters came into Israeli archaeology via Peru. People knew about it, but didn't use it. Mm. It was introduced later, maybe in the 70s. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Can, can I say something about it? Of course, Avi. <laughs> I, think, I think for those who spoke to Peru, he never, he never considered himself uh, an innovator of methodology. Of a, of a theory and not even methodology. <laughs> he was just working that way. He never, I don't think he was uh, fighting for a place in the history of archeology span of this uh, region. He was, he was aware of the fact that he's very good in the field and that's the way he did it. So if we say that, that he, nobody is following him in a school, in a theoretical or methodological school, 
Well, I, I don't think Perot is now uh, having problems wherever he is. I don't think he ever uh, uh, meant to be any, any of this. I think the major thing he had in oh, mind was, yeah. to, was to take archaeology out to the, to the public. And it is difficult for somebody who, who is not local. But he, he kept telling me many, many times, what are you doing there? A small pit and nobody can understand what you're doing. You have to excavate things like Sousa or bigger things so that everybody can, can understand what, what you are showing. I don't know if he succeeded in this, but I don't think methodology and theory were his uh, major. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, pro Avi idea because I spent several time with, the, with him as the boy following, following him. And we discussed this matter several times. And he always said, you have to adapt your method to the field and not to keep la like Leroy Gourin, the method in every place. So eh, everywhere you need to excavate in one meter, square meter, do it. But in sites, large sites like Monchata or Abu Mata, it's worth excavating in 10 on 10. And what I was astonished to hear from him. So I don't think he, he follow any methods. He tried to establish his own method, I think. Well, I think that Fanny want to, 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 to say something. Thank you, Francois. But for, uh, for me, the influence of uh, Peru, if there is one, is maybe at least the recording system because it's a very specific uh, system by catalog. And this is very different from what we, we do in France because we, we, we record in France by uh, stratigraphic units, which is totally different from uh, the catalog system. So this is something that uh, apparently is, is still is still in use in, uh, in Israel by the, I say, uh, it seeks um, how you you call that the basket. It is the same system, uh, but 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 for my part, the, the thing is that with Le Gourin, I think uh, Gwendolyn uh, uh, could say things also is uh, and, and Chloe because they have uh, Chloe has a look at the archive, but he, he, he may have also been influenced by uh, Le Gourin. He, he, he dug in Arcy sur and he follows the, the training course uh, done, uh, given by uh, Le Roi Gourin, and he, he, he even writes notes on these courses. This is Chloe that discovers his uh, archive, so it could be really interesting to, to go in, and I think uh, Gwendolyn uh, will do that uh, later if, if we got this, this AMS and possibility of postdoc. Um, and, and for me, also the interesting point. I, I don't know about these five uh, meters grids, but what I see is that you never use it in prehistoric sites as a Malara, and I don't think in Munhata either. He, he, in Malara, is not using this word. He's beginning. digging in, in planimetry. Yeah, but at the beginning, he started five by five, and then he removed the bolts. But not in Malara. There were never uh, grids like that, except the, the south sector that in the Kibish, which is apparently five by five, but not the main sector. And it's really in a, in a planimetric uh, dig. Um, also, the influence he may have from uh, Le Roi Goro is the fact that he brings with him uh, specialists in the dig. You have uh, Thérèse Poulin starting with him, uh, which is uh, archaeologist. Then you have uh, Ferenbach. Uh, anthropology that will dig herself her the skeletons. So this is maybe also an influence from uh, from and, uh, and and I think what will be interesting also is the, the, the influence he could get from Kenyan directly, because all that is the same year. What relations they, they have, and, um, because they dig totally differently. I think very differently. <laughs> Isaac, I want to add <coughs> a point to what you uh, to what you mentioned. You mentioned that the uh, recording system and the five by five uh, are still practiced in Israel. It is partially true. Uh, just to give an ex uh, an example, I was brought up on the archaeology of 
one by one square meter with three coordinates per artifact, right? And when I went to excavate GRAR, I asked colleagues that have experience in excavating <clears throat> sites, what is their system? And I also talked to Jean and his system, I think was for me the best, so I adopted it. The Israeli in these days only dig five by five, but the basic philosophy that you say it's so important, which means the catalog number that we translate into basket. In Israeli archaeology, basket is something different than Perot. Mm. For Perot, a numero de catalog is, is a slice of the site, right? For the Israeli archaeologists, every slice of a site is a locus. Now, the pottery they put into basket X of this locus, and the flint they put into basket Y. With Perot, all of them were in the same basket because it was an excavation unit. So what is left is not the Israeli digging system that is currently practiced. What is left is just the five by five. In case it is heritage, we are not sure about. Uh, uh, Philippe words are, are something to say. Uh, open, op, open your microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, thank you for this wonderful um, round table. Um, and from the other side of the world, um, I came in very late. So I, if I've, um, my comments you've already mentioned, please let me know. But um, I just like to make a couple of comments about Jean Perrault and his influence. If he wasn't interested in fine methodology or um, novel theory, I think he was still incredibly influential theoretically. If you consider that in the mid 1950s, he proposed forcefully on the basis of Ayn Malaha about um, sedentism preceding agriculture and these late Pleistocene hunter gatherers who'd settled. This was tremendously um, influential and penetrated deeply into Anglophone theory so that people like Binford, Flannery, and the rest always um, cite um, Ayn Malaha. It's in every of the world's textbooks on this critical period, as you know. So um, I think it more mattered to him what he thought about the grand lines of what happened, rather than uh, proving it specifically. He was a bit like Isaac Newton. You know, I have my orbits worked out theoretically, and uh, the astronomers later, they'll find the evidence to prove it. Um, and he worked quickly and moved on to another grand theme in, in the Neolithic, in the Calcolithic. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, that struck me, I met him once and um, he was unlike any other archaeologist I've ever met. He, he was what you would call an imperious man, um, a commanding and domineering man. He summoned me into his presence and told me what to do and what to th think. Actually, he got Gary Rollison to um, come and order me to meet him. And that was it. And so that presence as in France, his building, his, um, his, you know, his leadership, he was the boss. And um, he, he didn't really, I don't think, care too much about what people thought of his arguments or not. So anyway, there are my impressions. I think he was very important theoretically in the broad sense about what happened in history. Yeah, he was a great synthesizer. <laughs> well, he provided very good wine to us too. Can I add something? It's been uh, April. It couldn't change my uh, address. First of all, it was a fascinating morning. I like the subject, as you know. I want to relate to the provocative last question of uh, Itzik Gilad. What do you mean? Is it a more important or better than excavation. It is excavation and a very rewarding one and especially recommended for older age when you don't want to sit, you know, to dig uh, under the sun. Uh, it cannot replace uh, excavation, of course, not even the older one. Digging in the archives is not like re-excavating because you can never excavate the same layers. It's like you never can go to the same uh, river again. But the data, at least from my experience, that uh, one can get can really provide the leading uh, 
the leading instructions for future um, excavation. In the case of El Wad, because of the archives, we have a much more comprehensive and clearer view, even of the stratigraphy of the site that we had before, and now we kind of follow the same lines. And it's a very, very rewarding and important uh, contribution to science. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, I've got also a question for, 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 for you, who, who has worked directly on payroll archives. Um, do you think that uh, in his personal archive, uh, is there something which is not corresponding to what he has published? What I want to say in that way is to, for instance, if we take the example of Breuil. Breuil has never published anything about his relation with God and religion. Uh, he has published only scientific uh, con contribution, but if you read all these contribution, you cannot imagine what what are the re relations that Broy has with God and religion. But in the personal archives, you have some text uh, to unpublished for sure about this. What I want to say if, is in in, in Peru personal archives, is there anything which give us another? point of view of what you were thinking about, for instance, the question of sedentarity between the, the, the epipolitic and the beginning of the Neolithic? Is there more theoretical or, I don't know, uh, some, some or well, only a recording? Um, yeah, it, actually, yes, I was a bit disappointed to not find as much uh, personal data, like reflections and uh, I found yeah, some, yeah. sometimes in from what, but I didn't, I didn't uh, see a lot of his uh, archives, so I, I wouldn't be able to say. But um, and, yeah. and in the letter that is um, uh, uh, writing to um, different people, is there other other way of thinking that you can uh, determine or not? The only thing I would say is that I do feel, and maybe uh, the Julie or uh, who went through the archives more thoroughly than me or Erwan could say that I do feel like he organized a lot his archives before giving them. So yeah. I feel there's a lot of stuff that is could be there that is not there. Yeah. But this, is a, this is a feeling that I have, and I I, I did talk about. Uh, Personally, with the, this connection with uh, religion and the Bible is something I feel like could be uh, could be dug up more, and I'm still looking. But I do think that he's playing on this ambiguity, and I I feel it in his memoir and his carnet. It's evident. He's oh, he says things like it corresponds to a way of uh, telling history, and then after in another page, he's going to say. Uh, the Bible has nothing to do with uh, archaeology, so it's uh, so, there is something I think. And we, on the political point of view, is there anything written on a political point of view? I, I mean, uh, this his relation with Israel, with the Levant, uh, how how he has a uh, a cross or uh, all the, the the different wars and some. Is there something about that in his personal archives or nothing? Uh, about uh, about Israel, I think it's not clear. Like, but it it is evident that uh, he has built relationship. The only interesting find that I have made by going through a very small amount of archive is that he was present in in all the meetings from 1967 regarding uh, what was ha going to happen with the new. Um, Conquered uh, military like, uh, territories. That he was involved in this, uh, and he they asked for his opinion about what Israelis should do uh, in the new territories. So, just from this assumption, I'm guessing that he was uh, considered almost um, as an Israeli archaeologist, not as a French mm -hmm. archaeologist excavating uh, as a foreigner. In Israel, he was really part of the dynamics. So this is also an interesting, uh, uh, something that should be dug more. And I hope by going through more archives and especially cross-checking them with Israeli archives, I think we could find more about this uh, connection and his opinion about politics. And 
Uh, Julie, maybe she she know she went maybe briefly uh, through the archives. Or... No, I, I I never see something about his personal opinions and uh, in the archives I had uh, I had seen. Mm -hmm. But but also fifty percent of the archives were not processed. Yeah. And I think we have not opened the, the boxes of letters, actually. We, we have very few correspondence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to, to do. I think Laura wanted to raise a I question, maybe no. on the last one, if she's still here. I don't think so. I saw also her hand, but uh, I don't see her anymore. Maybe a uh, maybe a, a, a stomach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just. But I, I think uh, Philippe was very uh, right on uh, sedentism. Uh, I think he had a very big uh, role, and he, he played it, and that's very clear from the archives we have from Malara. And there are a lot of drafts of writing, and uh, these drafts from one to another. Uh, even if it was published at the end, the drafts are very important because there are many. Um, they are very different from uh, each other. And also we have a lot of uh, drafts of publications that were never published. In the 80s, he wanted to publish a lot on architecture, on pits, on whatever. And all of that, we, we have uh, the, the drafts. So uh, the, the archives are really rich. Uh, and I, I think also maybe if... The thing is that the, 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 the publications are, are now old and, and, and few people will come back to primary uh, publication like that. It's why he, his uh, influence also has uh, disappeared a bit. But uh, he did also publish important articles before these two books that uh, it's uh, um, say so. I think yeah. Chloe would like to add something and maybe then we we'll have to stop. <laughs> Just about them, I'm not able to say anything. I don't know enough about theory or methods, but I do feel from just uh, trying to retrace his uh, tr also pr personal trajectory. There is, I feel, uh, Jean Perrault before 1952, before he goes back to France and he studies with Leroy Gouron and then he meets Francois Borde. Okay. And uh, then there is really a shift in, uh, and he says it also in his memoir, something changed when he came back. And then there is also another uh, turn when he goes to the United States uh, at the end of the 50s and he meets uh, new people and it also then completely, he says it also, it changes his, uh, his method and his, uh, his, his way of uh, also excavating. So. Maybe, and he realizes that he was also doing things like you said, that he didn't even know uh, that uh, he hadn't read the papers of uh, Wheeler. So I think there is something that uh, shows that it's in, always important to kind of connect his biography, everything he does, where he travels with uh, the, and how it can shed a light on uh, this theoretical and methodological uh, evolution. So I think there is something to do. and. Uh, I have found us, I mean, I didn't find it was in the inventory, but I did look a bit into this file where he took notes of his, uh, his classes uh, of Leroy Gouron, where he's writing and he selects different information. And I think I'm not able to read this data, but I think there is something really interesting to, mm. to, to do about this, these notes that he took. That's it. So thank you very much for all of this very fascinating discussion and uh, yeah, the relationship between Leroy Gouron and Jean Perrault at least. Uh, it would be interesting to, to see how Leroy Gouron influence or not <laughs> uh, this, uh, this, uh, this archeologist. And so have a, have a good lunch mm -hmm. and, uh, and hope to see you soon in uh, <laughs> In Israel, for the one who are in France, because here yeah, now the and COVID. Vice versa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we hope to come back to France soon <laughs> as well. <laughs> so.
So have a nice, uh, have a nice afternoon and uh, stay care and stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.